How many of you wish you could? Let's see? I love that. I ask that almost everywhere I go because it's always amazing to me to hear how everybody who isn't a musician wants to be a musician and those who want to be a musician, but the pastors who have musicians don't want them. But the ones who don't have them want them and when they get them, they don't want them either. <laughs> and, and they're always, uh, thank you. And they're always saying, I don't understand these musicians. Why are they so weird? If you think we're weird, where do you get a hold of an intercessor? <laughs> Intercessors are musicians on acid. <laughs> and that's true. And what's so funny is we all worked here. That was a figure of speech, okay? Don't anybody quote me verbatim on that one. You're going to have to lighten up a little bit. Now, I know Brother Hill was pretty heavy this morning. I'm not Brother Hill. Uh, I'm, I'm right now working on a, a manuscript for a possible book, I don't know, about joy. And uh, one of the things I have learned is people need joy. And uh, the scripture says that they'll know you're my, Jesus said you'll, they'll know you're my disciples because of your love one for another. And uh, I know Christ suffered at his death and I know that he anguished over the cross. And I also know that he calls us to be intercessors. Everybody should be an intercessor. And at the same time, we heard a wonderful sermon on that just about three or four, four days ago about how that worship is the plow that plows things up and intercessors are the ones that break up the clots after it's plowed up. And, uh, you know, the Bible talks about break up your fallow ground. It basically is talking about a field that's already been plowed and turned over, but it's just been left there. And I'm afraid in music, I have to concur with that to a great extent because in music and worship what's going on right now is a lot of plowing up the heavens, plowing up people's souls, plowing up the spiritual ground and we just leave it lay and it doesn't go any further. So that's, the, that's why the need for the worshipers to also be intercessors and that's why the need that intercessors be in the church and I believe in people who are called intercessors and value them but I also believe that everyone is called to intercession. And uh, I believe we're all called to pray. We're all called to wrestle. And I believe in that, absolutely. And probably too little of that. And one of the hard things I have, uh, have to walk through as a worship leader, as I function as a worship leader in this revival, if this is a revival, I'm not sure what it is, uh, whatever it is, whatever has happened for the last five years at Brownsville, I have functioned as the worship leader. Uh, in past times, I've functioned as the associate pastor. Other times, I've functioned as the toilet scrubber. Sometimes, I've been the children's church leader. Sometimes, I've been the youth pastor. Sometimes, I have been the Sunday school coordinator. Sometimes, I have been the street evangelist. Sometimes, I have been the musical street evangelist. Sometimes, I have been the missionary. All things to all people is the key. And you got to learn, one of the hard things that I think that we have to learn in the kingdom of Christ is that none of those are more significant than others in the eyes of the Lord. And the other thing that we have to learn is that we all have a starting place and we all know the ending place. We all have a beginning, we all have an end. But one of the things that's happening now is worship, Pastor was talking about it last night, how worship is exploding across the body of Christ. And he said mid 90s and I kinda, Kind of mid 80s or so and, I, and I, I said pastor it was a little bit further back actually it was probably around the beginning of the 80s when that actually started to explode the end of 70s we had just come through the 60s and Christian music had seen a change uh, with a group called Love Song Andre Crouch and Disciples uh, all those all that great music uh, and it was an expression of people who were coming into the kingdom of God off the streets. Now Andre didn't. He was a preacher's kid like the rest of us here. Uh, but, but Love Song and many of those who, who came to the body of Christ and just started expressing their love for Jesus through the music that they knew. 
and it was called the Jesus Movement, and it was powerful, and uh, we mishandled it. Uh, some of us got a hold of it, and some of us threw, threw rocks at it, and uh, instead of being net repairers, we become stone throwers. And uh, right now, there's a big explosion of praise and worship. And the unfortunate thing is people have figured out it sells. That's always unfortunate. Because then it can become a praise and worship machine. And there are a lot of people that will start surfacing that go, hey, let's do it. The record company says, hey, we need a praise and worship record. Okay, get over here and write some stuff. I love you, Lord, with all my heart. I'm passionate. I'm mad about you. I'm crazy. I'm stupid. I want you to come. And we put it out, and there's no glory in it. it, it it's good music, and it says good things. But it, it lacks focus. Its focus and motivation is not from a desire for God, but rather a desire to sell a record or a product. Now, there's not big money in Christian music by any means. But you've got little people who see big money. And the ministry becomes polluted. And God still uses it. It's amazing. Isn't God wonderful? God used the, dog, the jawbone of a donkey one time. He's still doing it. He's still doing it. I want to start this session by saying that I've, I've got two notes li lined out here that I want to speak on, and they don't match. So if I go with this one, I can't go with this one, but I want to talk about both of them. Is that, <laughs> you ever been there? Uh, but I, what I'd like to do is open up the session this afternoon, and uh, I, I do this occasionally. I just want to ask you a couple of questions, uh, because at the end, I may not be able to get to, well, let me do it at the end. I'd like for you to prepare a couple of questions, and I'm just going to handpick a couple of questions and field them. I know that's dangerous, but I'll try to do it at the end. Just something you want to add or something you want to say. Uh, I don't like being a musician. Uh, I've struggled with it most all my life. Uh, I'm a mix. If I can use a secular term a couple times here, I'm about 60% melancholy. No, 40, excuse me, 40% melancholy, 60% sanguine. I'm a party waiting to happen. <laughs> and sometimes I get dark and I have dark parties. But uh, I, I, like, I like to rejoice. I like to worship. Uh, I'm frustrated in the church because uh, you're not, in, where I grew up, you weren't, expect, you weren't really appreciated or accepted unless you preached. And you were a great orator and you knew how to speak to people's lives and you knew how to move them. And of course, I grew up in a pretty lively environment. And, uh, and what I'm doing now would be real boring because, my God, we talked like this. Put lots of air in it and lots of vibrato. My God. Ha! And then if you could throw in a couple of swings of the, you know, if you kick the leg and shake the head at the same time. It's just, <laughs> Bodily exercise does profit a little. <laughs> That's kind of where I grew up. And so if you couldn't do that, and you were a musician, all, matter of fact, also when I grew up, only women played the piano in church. Men didn't play the piano in church at all. Uh, only the women. So it left a lot of things to the women when I grew up. They did all the praying, and they did all the worshiping, and... Uh, <laughs> Where were the men at during all that? I'm trying to figure. Uh, but uh, we were being tough watching football. Um, but I didn't want to be a musician. I, I, I struggled with it because I felt like I could never have anything to say significant into the body of Christ or, to, or that God would never use a musician because a musician, we all have a way of looking at musicians like, when are you going to get a real job? Um, 
you know, it, it was just not what I wanted to be, but I kept finding myself sliding back toward it. And, and uh, it was always like there. I never tried to be a worship leader. It just kind of happened. I don't understand people who want to be worship leaders. I don't understand people who want to be preachers. I wouldn't apply for the job by no means. It's a lousy job. And, but it's a calling. And it's a calling you can't get away from. Because the Holy Spirit's like a hound. And he sniffs you out wherever you go. And he will not leave you alone. And he will pester you. And he will mess up everything you try that isn't what he wants. Every plan you make goes backwards until you answer him. And it's quite frustrating. So I finally just gave in to it. And I preached for a long time. And I thought, I'm not going to play music anymore. I'm going to preach. And so I worked on my... Oh. Mm -hmm. And I got pretty good at it. I, I could put it on. I was putting on. I was trying on Saul's armor. Because uh, this is me. Not that. This is me. Isn't it amazing how the things in the body of Christ that we teach are, are it's a learned culture. There's a subculture called church. See, I don't believe God ever intended that to happen. I don't believe God made snowflakes alike. He meant his people to be alike. I don't think he meant for us to all dress alike, look alike, act alike, have the same culture. He created the culture, so I think he likes diversity. I long to see people bring their culture in, sanctify it, and make it holy unto God and offer it up to him as worship. That's what I believe. I, I, I believe that things that are sanctifiable, and you can't bring some things in and sanctify them. They're idolistic, and you have to get rid of them and just start over. But... We creative types are strange. And uh, the thing that I want to speak to you just a moment about is uh, a heart after God. And I, if I can get through this without crying, I'll be all right. I, I want to see God pour out his power. And a lot of people want to see God pour out his power. And a lot of people say they want to see God pour out his power. But what are we really asking for? And the better question is, why are we asking? The Lord gave me a vision somewhat years, some, so many years ago, well, that when I, it was a gift really, that when I would be in the presence of people, I had a way of looking in their eyes and I could see into their soul. I know that sounds kind of, ooh, but it's not. It would just happen. I would just be talking to a person I'd never met. I'd shake their hand, talk with them five minutes, and I could tell you a whole bunch about them. And it scared me. I realized later it was a gift of, of discernment, but, but, but it scared me because I would, I would look at them and go, I'll, I'll never forget a sermon one time there was a, a church in revival, and I was invited to go over. And I went over, and I knew the church, and I knew they were, they were a rowdy bunch. They got rid of a lot of preachers. There was church trouble there all the time. There was lots of bell heifers and kingpins. You know what I'm talking about? And then the religious demons, and they were all over the place over there. And I knew they were, because I knew the church really well. And... Uh, Somebody called me up and said, oh, Lindo, you got to come. We're having a mighty move of God. This guy's been here preaching for us for uh, six weeks. And, man, God's doing great things. And I had heard in the rumor mill, of course, you never can believe the rumor mill. Never, you know, don't believe half what you see and nothing you hear. And so I heard that, man, God was pouring out his power and people were getting saved. And, and I heard something that really got my antenna up. I heard that the church was was pay, paying this evangelist a lot of money and they were buying him suits and they, were, and they were tight as a bark on a tree. They paid their pastor $85 a week. You know, when you get religious demons, they don't want to give anything either. So I knew something was up. So I thought, well, man, God must really be moving. So I went over there and when I go into any kind of a meeting, I don't come in. 
I try not to come in with my religion on and going, okay, let's see what they got here. Yeah, well, I see that. I walked in, I thought, man, I just want to see what God's doing. I mean, these people have learned the spirit of giving. It's got to be wonderful. Let's go see what's happening. Went in the service that night. He, the young man preached a sermon, and it was real, really a great sermon. And he got to the end of his service. And he was prophesying over people and calling them out. And uh, I, I looked at him, and my spirit went like this. Instead of, oh, God, this is a move of God, my spirit went just like this. I thought, what is going on inside of me? And driving home, I was with my mother and father. And my mother has this gift of discernment. And sometimes when you have the gift of discernment, it's a little scary. Because it, it can turn into gossip real easy. Do you know what I'm saying? And what's unfortunate about it is you see more that's not right than what's right. You see more counterfeit than you see real. And so you, you can get self-righteous with it if you're not really careful and you don't walk in humility. So the, the car was strangely silent. And my dad, being the pastor and the sweet man he is, well, how did y'all like the service tonight? <laughs> Silence. And I wasn't going to say a word. I just thought, you know, God, that's something you showed me, and I'm not going to step out. Even though it's my mom and dad, I'm not going to say anything. And my dad goes, okay, you two, what? <laughs> my mother was the first. She said, something's not right. I said, yeah, it's not right. And I knew what was not right. I didn't say it, but I knew. About two months later, I heard that this gentleman, this young man was in a revival down in another city and that he had ran off with a young man from the church and went to South America in a homosexual relationship. When you see that, and we've all seen that, you realize the need for Steve Hill's type of preaching. Because we can all get flippant and we can all get into the things of God. But I ask you the question I started with again. Why do you want to see his power? And that's something the Lord's been facing me with. You see, I can see people in meetings who come up to me and say, pray for me. I want to be a worship leader. And when I lay hands on them, now I'm not a super spiritual person. I'm really not. I'm not. But it's when I lay hands on them, you can sense their heart. It's like it starts coming out. There's something about being saturated in the presence of God for the amount of years we've had here at Brownsville just every night and every night and every night. Your, your spirit gets real sharp and your sensory to the things of the Lord get real sharp. Uh, Consequently, you also get real aware of how lost the world is. You walk out in the mall or you flip on the television and suddenly you feel like things have gotten worse, but you know they probably haven't. It's just you haven't been looking that long that, at, at all that lately, and you haven't become... And again, I don't suppose to you that we're, I'm some holy man way up on this pedestal. I'm probably the most earthy one of anybody here. I, I'm just kind of me. And, you know, I'm, I, sometimes I'm too honest about things. Um, <laughs> and I'm a little ornery. Every once in a while I have a streak of ornery in me. But, but, but the thing of it is, is you can tell when somebody is going, I really want God. And, they're, when they're, and on the other side, when they're saying, I really want recognition. See, especially musicians because we are in a very strong peril. And I say this to pastors because I seek to bring some understanding today. Because there is a large gulf between the creative people in the church and the people who are not creative. And there's a big gulf of misunderstanding. And a lot of it we creative folks have brought on ourselves. 
But some of it is just the nature of, I don't understand it. Usually people who aren't creative are very organized. Most creative people are very disorganized. It's on my desk somewhere. Don't move a thing. I know right where it is. If, if anybody ever gets in my office and cleans my desk off, I can't find anything for six months. But if you'll leave it just a mess, I'll find what I'm looking for. Because I know right where it's disorganized and where it's at. There's an organization to my disorganization. Do you understand? I've got a way that I don't, I don't know where it is, but I know where it is. And if you'll leave it alone, I'll get it. But God help us all if you mess with it. So, this, this, this big misunderstanding exists, and there's no way to deny it or avoid it. But what I believe, because God is opening up worship in the body of Christ like never before, and it's across the board. It's across the board. Everybody, every denomination are opening up their arms to worship. They're opening up their hearts to worship and magnify God in a way that they never have before. They're wide open to the things of God where they used to be, oh, we want it this way, this way, this way. But the people of God are coming up and saying, there's something inside of me that's stirring up, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know what to do with it, but I am so hungry. And they're reaching toward worship. And what I'm seeking to do is bring the body of Christ together both pastors and creativity and, and arts and all that sort of thing. And I want to tell you, I get a little spooked by some of the artsy folks. They scare me sometimes. I'll admit it. They think on a different page. But I so believe what Pastor John spoke last night, that worship is bringing us to a place where the incense of the Lord is going up from the body of Christ and it's, it's about to push us into something else. Now, I am not a person who likes, who goes from one thing to the next. I don't like that. I get a little scared of those kind of folks who every time you're around them, there's a new revelation. <laughs> oh, we're all doing this now. Uh, you know, I, I've, 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 I've seen pastors who've done that. One moment they're going to, they're fashioning their ministry after... Uh, Oral Roberts, and the next minute they're Benny Hinn, and the next minute they're going to be Kenneth Copeland, and then the next minute, no, I'm going to be Reinhard Bonnke, and the next minute they're going to, and it makes the whole staff just stay in a total confusion. And then they read a John Maxwell book, and he's a wonderful writer, but then they go another way. Or they, or they saddle back Christian Community Church in California, and they all decide to put their saddles on, and it's like, and, and Rick Warren is a wonderful man of God with a wonderful message for his area. But then the whole church starts trying to turn this way. And, and, you know, I've seen it over five years. I've gone to churches that were trying to be Brownsville. Why? I don't understand why. Because I believe that God wants to pour out his power. But he's only going to pour it out where the, the ground has first been cleaned. All the garbage is gone swept away, cleaned up, and has been plowed up, and has been broken up, and then the seed is planted and God brings a harvest. I believe those are the conditions that have to be present for God to pour out His power. But what, you know, none of us alive really can say what a revival definition is, except to revive the saints, because we've really never seen a city taken. Most of us have never seen a city taken for Christ. We've never seen that kind of thing happen. So we have no living explanation to go, yes, I lived and I remember when Kansas City or I remember when Paris, France all wept before the Lord and they met in hordes of people just 
groves of people in the middle of the city and they wept before the Lord and they had collective services in all the, ch in all the chapels and all the cathedrals and they all bowed and wept and worshiped God. I remember how that happened. I remember how that they had to close down all of the, the illicit bookstores and how they had to shut the taverns down. I remember how that was a wonderful time. None of us can really say that we've seen that happen on a large scale. But I believe as worship has started to be planted in the hearts of God's people and we've taken worship from three songs on Sunday morning, sang out of a book, and we've brought it into a place where we don't really know what we're doing. We're not really sure what it is, but we know that the scripture says that the Lord is seeking across and looking for those that would worship Him in spirit and truth. The Lord says, I'm looking for those who will worship me. Now, what's He going to do with those that worship Him when He finds them? That is where I believe you will see revival break out. Now, we don't need to give music more credence than it needs in the church. Matter of fact, my desire is that we get to a place in worship where we really don't need music at all. We walk in and the glory comes and we worship from the, from the pews. Because this still is too performance oriented and I dislike it immensely. I just haven't figured out how to change it yet. I think it will change by the design of the Lord. There's always been a man, there's always been a leader, but I believe that the design of the Lord is that his people worship him. And he doesn't care what their voice sounds like, what their ability is. And I don't think he's going to send worship to someone who's hoping it'll be good enough to put on a record. When Brownsville started, we didn't intend on making any records. And uh, the gentleman, Larry Day, is here who runs my ministry. He's the general manager over at Music Missions International. And we are in a constant state of prayer as to whether we should continue on. Because it's so easy to create a machine. It's so easy to start spitting out stuff for the sake of spitting out stuff when God is not moving and He's not saying anything. So I ask you again, what do you mean when you say you want God's power to pour out? and realize that the Holy Spirit is smart. God is smart. He knows you. Matter of fact, He knows something about you, many things about you you don't know and me. He knows really what is in our heart. The Bible says we don't even know that. We don't even know what's in our wicked and deceitful heart. But the Father in heaven knows what's inside of your heart. And he knows, and, and I remember when I was a kid, we used to laugh at, the, you know, little, we'd have testimony service, and some little sister would say, if I know my heart, I love the Lord. And I used to laugh about that. I'm going, well, how stupid. She was smarter than I realized. She was saying the truth. I really don't know my heart. But from what I know right where I stand today, I love the Lord. When you want to see God take your city, why do you want to see God take your city? You see, that's a simple question without an easy answer. I want to see the arenas filled with people worshiping and praising God and praying and interceding for the nations. Why? And one would think, well, that's an obvious answer. But it's not obvious. It's very easy to move into a humanistic motivation in the church and in ministry. I'm speaking to ministers today, so I'm going to talk to you like ministers. I'm not going to talk to you like I'm talking to some child. I received the Holy Spirit when I was five years old. I started in ministry when I was 17. I've been in ministry now tw 20 years. I'm 37 years old. And I've seen a lot. And I have seen people who did like Saul, who started off hiding among the stuff. When somebody had 
to bring any accolade to them or any appreciation, their face turned three shades of red and all the blood went to their face and, and they, you know, and they, they just fidgeted with their hands. They didn't know how to, how, how, uh, well, I, I'm not, I didn't really, I, 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 God loves that. My young musicians here, I'll go, you guys did good tonight. Well, that's the musician in them. Oh, it was awful. I played bad. I remember. I said, you know what? Thank you will be a nice word to say. Thank you. Then you go home and you go, God, I didn't do anything good. It was you. Just thank you. And, but always knowing where you really are. Always knowing who you really are. Always knowing that at a moment's notice, you could turn your back on the Lord. At a moment's notice, you could walk away. At a moment's notice, you could fall into illicit sin. At a moment's notice, you could mess up. There go I, but for the grace of God. So before we all get all haughty and spiritual, and all lifted up in our religious pride, let's ask ourselves, why do I really want God to move? I've, I'm just talking to you. I've got texts. I'll, I'll prove it. I've got two pages here, okay? But I, I do better if I just talk to you. When I moved here, I didn't want to be here. And many of you have heard me say that before. I didn't want to be here. I found that every great thing God has done in my life has been when I didn't want to do it. God has never, ever asked me to do something I wanted to do. So I have a tough time when I meet young people. Now, I wanted to be a musician. I mean, I really did. I studied. I, I'd get down the basement of my house and, or the church, and I would play for hours and hours and hours, and I would study to show myself approved. But then when I got older and I realized that musicians don't make any money, and I realized that they're not respected in the church to have a voice, I thought, Wait a minute. God has called me, and I want to be heard. So forget this musician stuff. I'm going to be a preacher. Well, what God really threw me a curve. At 17, he called me to preach, which really messed all my wiring up. Because I was quite happy with being a musician, and then suddenly I'm called to preach, and then I want to, I feel this burning. You know when you're called to preach, you feel like you got something to say, you really ain't got nothing to say, but you feel like you got, a, it's like, give me that mic, I'm going to tell you a thing or two, and you get up there and go, uh, uh, God so loved the world, um, um, uh, 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 I love the Lord. Crying will always work. Just go over to tears, and people just feel sorry for you, and they go... Bless his heart, he loves the Lord, don't he? You know? And, and, and you, you cry out of embarrassment. You're just like, so embarrassed in your knees. You know, if you, if you get the devil's head between your knees, you could kill him. You could beat his brains out. You're like, bum, 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 bum. And, and, and you're just scared to death. And you're going, I don't really want to do this. And, but, but it's burning, and it's kind of the... <laughs> As the great writer wrote, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I mean, it's like at the same time, you've got this burning thing inside. You've got to get out, but then you're scared to death to open your mouth. Talk about messing you up. And so I just, I wanted to be, you know, we all want to be significant. We all want to say something that, that has an effect. It, when we're called to the ministry, we want to have an impact on people. We want to, we want to do something. And, and sometimes if we're not careful, we find ourselves jumping in to other areas other than our calling because we think it's more fruitful because what we're doing is not showing a lot of fruit. And probably that's where I was when I came here because I was doing music and I was, I was, you know, I was going to churches and doing that sort of thing, but I was, I was finding it not fruitful. I felt like I was more kind of like an entertainer. I would go in and entertain the saints for about 20 minutes and then the preacher would come and actually preach the word and then I would walk away and go, well, I got paid. I didn't see anything happen, but I got paid. So I guess I'll eat this week. Long about October before I moved here in April. See, what's beautiful about the Spirit of God is God 
See, worship is about the Father to the Father, and it's God that puts worship within you. Because your righteousness and mine is filthy rags. But when he puts something holy in us, and we're free enough to express it back to him without regard to our personal dignity, and we just lavish it back on him, then God is glorified. It's kind of like he's got this thing going where he glorifies himself through us. It's a wonderful thing. And that's what God intended to do. And, and God will come upon you sometimes when you least expect it. I got up one morning and I was on my way to the coffee shop and I was just walking along. And quite frankly, my thoughts had not been of the Lord. It had probably been three weeks since I'd picked my Bible up. Even longer since I'd prayed. I wasn't on fire at all. Matter of fact, I probably would call myself backslidden, but I'm too religious to say that, so I probably would say I was cold in the Lord. Where did that come from? <laughs> Not scriptural, is it? But we all say it. Well, I'm just, I was just kind of cold in the Lord, and hot or cold is one or the other, isn't it? In or out, but oh well. Don't confuse me with the scripture. Just, just. That's how we do things. We get these little sayings like, well, I'm kind of cold in the Lord. And that's where I was. I was really backslidden in my heart. I was walking along on my way to <laughs> go to pick up, you know, I was going to pick up the newspaper at the, at the coffee shop. It was a bookstore there, really kind of a vibey place, you know, and there was a coffee shop upstairs and all kinds of books. And I would go in and pick a couple things up and I'd spend an hour or two reading and occasionally I'd read the Bible, but hey, you know, I mean, it's not as relevant as what's happening on the front of some magazine. So I'd pick those up and think, I'll have more to say if I read those, you know, and because I know all the Bible. I've gone to church all my life, you know what I'm saying? You know, I've heard it all preached and I'm walking along and the glory of God, the power of God came on me like, boom. And my inside started, the innards, my innards started trembling and my tears started to flow just like a spring and out of my being came a prayer and I was astounded at the prayer that came out of my being and I prayed to the Lord and I said God I am so tired of religion I'm so tired of hearing people preach about miracles and never seeing them. I am so tired of people being worked up to a frenzy but going home and sinning. I'm so tired of Christians professing what they don't possess, and me included. I'm tired of preaching the gospel and never praying. I don't really even know you, but I stand up like I do. I am so tired, God. I am so desperate. And I said something that came out of my mouth, scared me. I don't think I've ever shared this, but I said, God, if you're not going to move on me and you're not going to cause me to be real and you're not going to turn me around, then I'm getting totally out of this song and dance called ministry. And I'm going to go get a job at a business and I'm going to excel at it because I'm a go-getter. I can do it. I can do anything I set my hand to. I'm not self-confident. I just know that 98% of the people are doing nothing. So if you do something, you're going to get way ahead of most everybody else. Most people are sitting on their couch watching TV or going to movies and wasting their time. So if you do anything, you're way ahead of most folks. Because our world is entertainment bent. They'd rather be entertained than do anything else. So I thought, I'm getting out of this. God, if you're not going, and I wasn't giving God an ultimatum. I mean, who am I to give God? I mean, I wasn't even right with God. But it was just like a spirit. It was spirit to spirit just coming up out of me. And I said, God, when I was a little boy, I saw miracles. I saw people get out of wheelchairs. I saw a blind man receive his sight. I saw a child with polio run around a building, actually a tent one night. I saw your hand. I felt your power on me. All I see now when I go to church is a bunch of people, including me, who sing about you like, like we're numb and like we're dead. 
we're singing about something that we think is true, but the power of God has never really saturated us to where we could undeniably say, this is God, regardless of who's there or whether the preacher lives right or he doesn't. But God, I haven't seen you show up at your own house and speak for yourself. And I'm saying to you, God, if you don't, if you're not ever going to do that, if we're too far, then let me get out of this. I can't be a hypocrite anymore. I'm going to go be a businessman and make some money. And then just as quickly as it came on me, it went off. And I went down and read the paper. <laughs> kind of going, what was that? But see, God wasn't finished. He started turning the heat up. And then I couldn't sleep. And then something inside was churning and churning and churning. And I said, God, I've got it. It was kind of churning like it is this morning. This afternoon, I, I feel that familiar churning in my spirit. It's a restlessness. It just won't be satisfied. See, God will put the prayer in you and then put the hunger in you. Because if it was something you could do, then you could take some credit for your spiritual fervor. You can't take one ounce of credit for your spiritual fervor or your pious attitude. You can only say that God has done a great work in me. God has done a great work. Surely this is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful in our sight. God messed me up so bad that when I finally got here, I was literally, when, it, when revival came or whatever we're doing came, I just kind of went, wow, what do I do? And I found out that crying was mostly what I did. I'd cry and I'd cry. And I wasn't a big crier before these meetings, but cry, 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 all the time, just cry, 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 cry. And God was showing me my motivation. I went to Nashville, Tennessee because I wanted, when God, can I, I'm just talking to you. When I was 18 years old, the Lord gave me a vision. He said, I'm going to fill stadiums and arenas with people worshiping. And I want to use you. Of course, I had no idea. I thought maybe I'd be sweeping up after the meeting or something, you know. I said, sure. And I saw it vividly as if it were just the, yesterday's television. I mean, I just knew that God was going to do this great thing, but I had lived enough life that all of it had gotten beaten out of me. Does anybody identify here? I had, I had had all that beaten out of me, and I'd, I'd been disillusioned, and I, I'd come to the end of myself. And all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, here I am in these meetings. And I'm going, what? What am I doing here? I don't deserve to be here. I didn't pray to get here. I didn't fast for this. I can't take any credit for this. God yanked me up. See, I went to Nashville because God gave me a vision when I was 18. I thought I'd help God out. And here's the word that I feel the Lord has given me for you today. The Lord says to you that I don't need your help. That should take a great load off of you. I don't need your help. I'm God all by myself. And I'm capable of fulfilling what I've put within you. He who began a good work in you is able to fulfill it, to continue it, to finish it, to bring finish to it. He didn't start it in you as a cruel father. Why are we frustrated in ministry? Because we have been pulled away by our own lusts. And we decided to help the Lord out because he wasn't moving on our schedule. So God wasn't moving on my schedule. So I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a part of this great worship experience, I guess I need to go to Nashville because surely if God's going to do it, he's going to do it in Nashville. That's where all the musicians are. They got all the studios there, all the media's there, man, all of it's there. Why wouldn't he do it there? Let's go to Nashville. 
I went to Nashville, man, I was hoofing and trying to make a living, playing in studios and trying to get production work. And that's a tough world. If you've never done it, it's a tough world. You're, there's 10 people who play better than you. 10 people who sing better than you. And if they don't like the way you play or the way you look, they use you for one session and then they call another guy. And then they, because Nashville's kind of a small place, then they put the word out on you. I had Cooley, but he couldn't do it. So he said, Cooley can't do it. Cooley can't do it. Cooley can't. So nobody calls you. So you step on the phone going, hello? Uh, excuse me, Bell South? Did I pay my bill? Would you ring this phone operator because it has not rung for a long time? And I'm just wondering if it's broken. You're sitting by there waiting for work to come. So I decided to help God out. Man, I had all the plan worked out, how we were going to do a music school, and we were going to do this, and we were going to raise up worshipers, and da-da-da-da-da. And it was all going to happen right there in Nashville, because I mean, that's where it's supposed to happen. God puts a vision within us, and then we start helping him out. Man, this great vision that God's given me, it can't happen where I am. Look at these people. The church you pastor, you look around and go, not here, God, maybe the next one. How soon are we going to get out of here, God? What do you want me to learn so I can hurry up and get out of here and get to where you want to do? Anybody identifying? How soon, God, can I get rid of these musicians and get something that can play, Lord? Uh, God, I just see this great worship coming up, and I go home, and this little woman at the piano, eh, God, have you ever heard of windshield wipers? She plays like windshield wipers. Brum, pa, pam, brum, pa, pam. And, and I just can't figure out. I've been trying to get her to do send the fire, Lord, and she just hadn't got it. Brum, pa, pam, brum, pa, pam. I got this new Daryl Evans song, Lord, that I feel like God's really on. I, you know, it's that one about, about I'm trading my sorrows, and Aunt Martha on the piano still plays it. Brum, pa, pam, brum, pa, I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. And Lord, I just see a wonderful worship experience. God, you've given me a vision that this whole city is going to worship, so it must not be here, or either you've got to kill Aunt Martha. <laughs> so we start helping God out. We try to get all the players in there to try to make our, we try to put our vision together. He who began a good work in you is able, without your help, <laughs> To complete it. How many have a vision? How many, how many, at some point in your Christian walk, you felt like God really let you see what he had called you into in the future? How many of you have not seen it? How many are frustrated about it? Amen. Of course. But he who gave the vision will fulfill it. So I, I just thought I'd help God out. And then when God said, go to Pensacola, why? You can't do anything in Pensacola, God. I mean, that's a big old church, and it's got 1,600 people, and, and it's kind of boring. And they sing out of hymn books, and, and they won't like my music there. And, and God said, go. And then when God got here, he played a real dirty trick on me. I came with my notebook of songs, and he wouldn't let me sing any of them. All the ones that I had all the flat 13ths in, you know, that real big choir sound and stuff. And oh, God wouldn't let me pull any of it out. I'm singing, he has fire in his eyes. What a hokey song. That's what I'm singing. All during revival. God said, not only am I going to move you somewhere you don't want to go, I'm going to let you sing music you don't want to sing. And then I'm going to use it. That ought to let us all know how important we are. <laughs> all I, did the Lord say he'd rather have obedience and sacrifice? So I, I, probably the first time I've really obeyed the Lord in my whole life is when I come to Pensacola. I mean, without giving him a lot of trouble. Really? 
because he told me what to do. He gave me the vision. God's got a way of doing that because he's working the character of Christ out in us. And he's more concerned that the character of Christ and the heart be purified and the motivating strength of the heart be proper and right than he really cares about you ever having a ministry. Because God will fulfill his kingdom with no one. His kingdom will come. There are thousands who have never bowed to Baal. There are thousands out there who are more talented than I am. There are thousands who can sing better than me. There are thousands who can preach me under the table. And they have wept bitter tears begging that God would use them. But for some reason, I'm here right now. Go figure. But I'm so amazed. And I'm asking you a question today. Examine your heart as best you can. Now, how I examine my heart, I've got kind of a, a way I do it. You know how I do it? I ask myself this question. What if I have to do what I'm doing right now the rest of my life? And when I really can get happy with that thought and trust God to say, okay, God, long as I have you, then I'll do what I'm doing right now the rest of my life. Then I'm probably getting my motivation right. Maybe I'm getting close. Because you see, God has great plans for you. He has a great vision for you. But when you try to help him, you hinder the process and make it long. And you make it more painful. And you make him have to make you go through times where you wonder where in the world he's at. And he's right back there where you took off trying to help him. It's like we're little puppies. I've got two little puppies. I named them Finney. I have a boy and a girl. One of them is named Finney after Charles Finney. We're real spiritual at my house. Uh, my girl dog's name is Katie after Catherine Booth. Doesn't that sound great? So I've got Katie and Finney. And they aggravate me to death. They're about three months old. And every time I get dressed for church... <laughs> They come dancing around, jumping all over my clothes, you know. And all I want them to do is sit down, but they'll go three times around my leg and three times around the run out, run back, and go all, just fall over, you know. And they're just like going nuts. And I'm just standing there waiting until they calm down, and then I'll pet them. We're like that with God. God says, I've got a vision for you. I'm going to use you greatly. <laughs> and God's going, if you'll settle down, <laughs> I'll get you where you're going, boy. Just get all that out of you and get over here. Then after we're worn out, frustrated, aggravated, and mad at everybody, we find ourselves back at the feet of the Lord going, okay, God. And he goes, okay, now, are we listening? Let's go this way. And all of a sudden it happens, and then we go, wow! <laughs> you know? Is it true? <laughs> I never expected God to do what he did here. I was amazed. It's amazing what God can do when he get, puts his mind to it. <laughs> He's an amazing person. And he can bring you to a place you don't want to be and make you love being there. And, and, and he can let you do things where you just, you stand back and go, wow, what is this? But the motivation has got to come out. So I invite you, another, part two, let me tell you my second way I find my motivation. I have a way of, it sounds kind of somber, this is my melancholy side. I get my Bible, and I close all the doors, and I shut all the sounds out. And sometimes it takes a long time, because God's not too much on short order. He's not like Burger King, he's kind of more like a 12-course meal over in 
New Orleans where you sit there half the night. It's like a Middle Eastern feast. It just keeps coming and we wait a long time between. And I'll get down there and I'll get the word of God and I'll say, now God, I see pride in me. I see arrogance in me. I'm noticing people are patting me on the back a little too much. Lord, just, just show me really what I am. Show me really what I am. And you know what? He'll do it. If you let him do that, he'll start showing you stuff and you'll go, oh, but he's so kind. He don't show you more than you can handle. I'm afraid if he really showed us all we really were, <laughs> we'd just go nuts. But he shows us just enough and then he gives us grace. Then he pours his grace in and says, now, son, handle that and I'll use you some more. Yes, sir, I'll do it. And sometimes I have to go apologize to my wife because I've been ugly to her. Sometimes I have to spend a few days without food. Sometimes I have to spend a few days in prayer. Sometimes I have to apologize to dear friends. Sometimes I have to just kind of realign my thoughts. I close with this. What I want more than anything else is to look up to the Lord and say, God, I really want your presence. And as far as I know at that moment, there's no other reason I'm asking than just the sake of his presence. God so much wants somebody to love him. Now, he doesn't need it. He's God. He needs nothing. But he wants it. And I wonder tonight, today, where you're sitting right there, how much love is he getting from you? How much worship is he getting from you just for the sake of it? Why do you think he put Song of Solomon in there? It wasn't for all the young boys going through puberty in church. He put it in there because he wants that kind of relationship with his people. He wants a touchy-feely relationship. He wants a naked relationship. He wants a relationship where you're vulnerable and you run the risk of being embarrassed. But because of his great love, he would never embarrass you. He wants that closeness, nothing between you and he nothing. He wants to hear you say, I want you, Lord, and know that in your, in your mind, in your heart at that moment, you're not thinking about a great ministry. You're not thinking about cutting a worship CD. You're not thinking about having your church fill up so you can pay the bills. You're not worried about your name. You're not wanting your name plastered on anything. You're not wanting to write a book. You're not wanting to preach at a great church. You're not wanting any recognition other than the fact that you want him to hear you say, how I love you, how I want you. Is it possible for us fallen creatures to have a relationship with someone so divine? I say yes. But the fault is not on his end, it's on our need to continually wash ourselves because we, we get the world on us and junk on us as we walk through day to day. Somebody said, Lindo, how do you live in that place? Well, you're going to have nasty days, you're going to have times you're not in that place, but that's the reason that you wash yourself with the water of the Word of God and you cleanse your heart, cleanse your heart, you sinners, and purify your heart, your mind, you double-minded. Get your heart right before the Lord. God has given you the ability to renew your mind. You renew your mind. You don't pray that God will renew your mind. The scripture said, be transformed by renewing your mind. When the apostle wrote that, he wrote that to the believer. He said, you can be transformed when you renew your mind. How do you renew your mind? You wash it. You wash it with what's in this book. You wash it with worship. And when it's clean, then you can have that intimacy. I've heard Steve Hill say a lot of times, 
I've never seen a bride come down the aisle with a dirty dress on. Somebody get that. I've never seen a bride with a dirty dress on either. Matter of fact, I've never seen a bride on her wedding night with mud from head to toe either. When I was married and went on my honeymoon, my wife put on beautiful things for me, long flowy things. And she smelled wonderful. And she had this little twinkle in her eye. Anybody remember those days? We still have those days. And I'm closing. I'm continuing to close. <laughs> now as I continue to close, I, I, really, I haven't even read my text. I'm sorry. I, you all know I had one. Um, when I got married, I, I stayed single till I was 32. And uh, 33 actually. I got married when I was 33. And when I got married, I thought I understood. I thought, now, you know, we get married so we can procreate and have children and populate the earth and have a companion and not a, wrong. We get married so that we can understand how Christ wants us to behave. And he gives us a, a physical example of a heavenly work. We get married so that we understand how a groom should treat a bride. And when, when, whenever we husbands want our wives to do the right thing, we always go over to Corinthians and tell them that they are to submit. We love that submit scripture. That's a good one. It's handy. It'll work when nothing else does. You always throw the Bible out there. It just, it's the Word of God. It's fine. Everything is really cool until you back up and you read the part. Actually, that go forward and you read the part where it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, excuse me, but that ain't fair. She's got to submit to me, but I got to love her like Jesus loves her. Uh-uh. This ain't Jesus standing here. <laughs> and it even gets further in the... I used to think that we have children because they're the, the heritage of the Lord and, you know, we need to carry on our name. Uh-uh. We have children to show us how the Heavenly Father feels about us. I can look at my little boy and just get warm and fuzzy when he's just sleeping with drool coming out of his mouth. He could have a stinky diaper on and somehow I would never go near that before I was married. And now, you know, I'll pick him up, smell that sweet fragrance <laughs> and go, Mama, Samuel has something for you. But the Heavenly Father looks on us that way. And I'm telling you, it's blowing my mind every single day. And I'm saying, Lord, nothing in between. No walls, no pretense, no false hope, no desire other than you. And I pray for you that as you walk out of this place this week, that the Lord would further that in your spirit. Because I want to tell you something. God knows when you want something out of him, and he knows when you just want to love on him. He knows the difference, and he responds to the, le to the latter more than the former. He'll respond to you when you just crawl up in his lap and say, Daddy, I just wanted to tell you today that I really do love you. And, you know, things are lousy, but you don't have to necessarily do anything about it. I just love you today. Watch him go. But see, he knows if we're working him, too. 
Things are bad. God, I need help. Let me worship you a while. Hallelujah. And things get worse. Because he's going, hey, I told you you're going to suffer a little bit. You can suffer a little bit longer until you get your heart straight and you come to me and say, Father, forget what I'm going through. It doesn't matter. Compared to the beatings of Christ and the sufferings of my Lord, it's nothing. I count this small affliction, this light affliction, as Paul said, the guy who was bold and all, beat all those times, you know, and we have a bad day. I, excuse me, you know. I count this light affliction not worthy to compare with the ultimate greatness of just knowing who you are, just the hope of seeing you one day. I don't even care if you fix it. I don't care what happens to me. I just want you to know that I love you. It's harder to do that some days than others. But I pray that as you go throughout your days, that the Holy Spirit would teach you that. Because I have a sneaky feeling that when we get in that kind of relationship, People are going to start seeing something different in our face and we'll start treating people differently. And I have a feeling we'll have a great harvest of souls because people will look at them and go, man, that guy's just full of love. I want to know what he's about. I want to know what she's about. Hey, tell me about, well, why is it you, why is it you always got this glow about you? Well, if that isn't a door into witness, I don't know what is. It can happen. It's called the high pro glow. You eat spiritual food, you get the high pro glow. Hallelujah. I don't know. What time am I supposed to be finished? Three? I've left time for questions. Now, you see, you didn't know I was that smart. Hallelujah. I'll take a few questions, and then we'll, then we'll let you go. I don't want to wear you out. Yes, ma'am. You speak awfully soft, and you sound like you're from a foreign nation. You sound English. Uh -huh. I love it. Thank you. Uh, I'm on a worship team, and as I'm not the worship leader, uh, they uh, wait on the Lord, but, um, and we have a sort of a list and a song list, but I'm wondering if it's more like a conversation with the Lord where um, you wait on the Holy Spirit to know which song to sing next. And yet, if the Holy Spirit doesn't say something to you, it's like conversation, so you just offer something to the Lord anyway. Um, well, number one, I think people who lead worship have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And one of the hardest things that we worship leaders have to deal with is uh, knowing when to shut up. Y'all got, got a talky worship leader too, haven't you? Oh, glory to God! Hallelujah! You're thinking, man, he needs to start rapping. <laughs> and, and I went to a church recently where the musicians didn't know when to shut up. Sometimes God wants to come in, a lot of times, and he doesn't want us to play. He don't need any accompaniment. And uh, we have song lists, and that's good. It's very good to have song lists. It's, it's a wonderful thing to have song lists. And as a worship leader... Before revival, I did song lists. At, since revival, I rarely do a song list. Uh, I just, what I do is I put all the lyrics up there, and if, if it hits me, I do it. But that's how I do it. There are other people who feel, feel real uncomfortable with that. But I feel like that, that you do need to wait on the Spirit of the Lord, but sometimes it, it, it's not a waiting process as much I don't think you're going to offend the Holy Spirit if you make a wrong turn. And a lot of people get concerned with that. They feel like they're going to run God off if they mess up as a human being. Where you'll run God's presence away and run it away from the place is when you move in the flesh and you go, I've got this under control, thank you, I don't need any help, let me move on. But where you, if you honestly make a mistake, you take a wrong turn. Uh, when I'm in a, in a, in a meeting uh, in a Pentecostal church, uh, I don't have this problem in a lot of evangelical churches, but I do occasionally in Pentecostal churches. Inevitably, somebody wants to speak in other tongues and give out a prophecy. And I just kind of make a, a blanket statement. Uh, I'm not going to permit you to do that in this setting because I'm a visiting minister and I don't know who lives right and who doesn't. So I can't open the floor for people to prophesy. 
Now, if you have a word, the pastor is sitting here, and if pastor feels like your word is, has credence and he wants to interrupt anything I'm doing, then I definitely submit to that. But please honor me, because the worst thing Pentecostals do is, is that. And, and it's sad because it, it works fine if you're a small body and everybody knows everybody and they know who lives right and who doesn't. But in a big meeting like this one, you don't know. I don't know any of you. I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're, you're living right before God. I don't know if you're, you've left your wife and you're living with a lover. I don't know what's going on in your life. So I, I have to be careful and just say don't. It's the same token. If you sing the wrong song, it's not the end of the world. You just back up and sing another one, you know. I, I hit lots, I get up here a lot of nights and I'm just looking. I'm like, I hate to go to the doctor. When we got married, we had to go get those blood tests. And, and I don't do needles real well. And, and it, inevitably, if I ever go, they can't find a vein. <laughs> it's the same thing a lot of times when I get up here to lead worship because I want the people to come with me. See, my sense is that we all worship the Lord. And sometimes... You, you sing songs and the Holy Spirit doesn't like that song that particular night. It just isn't. It may be the song you want to sing, but it's not the one he wants to hear. And so you just sing it and you get it over with and you close it and you go to the next one. <laughs> and you go, okay, let's try this one. I have actually sang half of a verse before and stopped. I really have. I've been like, da 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 Well, that's not working. Let's go with this. And I just knew it wasn't the right thing. Uh, and there are times of just waiting on the Lord. I think the Lord will direct you to what song to sing. Sometimes the Lord wants you to sing a song you don't know. And I find a lot of times when you're praying, when I find, I find that I'm praying is, what should I sing next? I don't spend a lot of time praying as, what do I sing next? Usually God gives me the song I'm going to sing next in the middle of the last song. And he's unfair sometimes because he'll just give me a line or two. And it may be a song I haven't sang in 20 years. And so I just hit a key and head out there. And sometimes, you know, it's one of those, oh, hey, oh, 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 oh. Ah. you know, you're trying to find out. Now, see, does that start on a, a fifth, a third? Where does it start? And you go, hey, where he leaves me, I, you know. But it's all about being open. It's, it's, it's okay. The Holy Spirit, he loves us when we try, you know. Uh, Lindell, could you tell us uh, just how, how much uh, leeway that Pastor Kilpatrick has given you as far as carrying the worship and, and as he said, okay, I want it to go this far and, or uh, you know, I'll just try to communicate back and forth as it's going or how do, you, how do you do that and is it different on Sunday morning as opposed to the revival services? So glad you asked, David. Thank you. Uh, this is something I'm, I was hoping would come up. Uh, remember, we talked about this large gulf between musicians and pastors. Uh, a lot of times a musician will come into a church and he will have a burden to sing the new songs. He will have gone to a worship conference somewhere and got a new bag of songs. Can't wait to get home to sing them. He works the band up. And nobody in the church wants these songs sung. They all want to sing the old songs. They don't like these new songs. So he tries to force them in to listening to this new kind of music. Well, remember, you can't force anybody anywhere. You can lead them there, but you can't force them. And a lot of times, I've said this before, but a lot of times people will not follow you because they just don't like you. And you've probably given them much reason to not like you. In working in a church, it is a real odd thing. And I, I'm talking to preachers and ministers, so let's just talk the real truth here. You have to walk a line. Some would call it compromise. Musicians are the worst to go. Oh, I just can't compromise my, my values. I've got to sing what, I've got to be me. Paul said, be all things to all people. Paul said, I am nothing save Christ. So, a lot of musicians frustrate over the fact that they, their pastor won't let them flow. 
it was, here's my favorite one. I hear it all the time. Man, I, what do you do when your pastor, man, it's just like it's about to break loose and things are going to, and he comes up and takes the service. Well, yeah, I can sympathize with that because, you know, how many times do we worship leaders get broken on by pastors? Oh, I just feel a word of God. You know, but we never come up to him in the middle of his sermon and go, hold on, pastor, you know, stay right there. That last point, I got a song that will just drive that point home. <laughs> let, let me just do that. Let me just do this. Let me do this song right here, and, and it's just going to drive it. I'm telling you, it's going to drive it home. And you do the song, and go, and now go on with point three. You know? <laughs> I understand that. I really do. But the thing of it is, is we're called to serve. And you build relationships with people. And they learn that they can depend on you. They learn that you'll submit to them. They learn that you will not buck the system. Uh, and, and the problem that musicians have is uh, tremendous egos, a little bit of arrogance, and a great deal of pride that we wrestle with on a regular basis. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. That's why, you know, that's the whole nature of our gifting. That's what they don't, what people need to understand about us is that's our gifting. It's our nature. It's, of course, it's everybody's nature to a certain degree, but to us, it's part of our creative being that need to feel like we're free even though we're not. We can be in a bigger cage as long as we feel like we're not confined. It's all right. You know, just put us in a big sanctuary as long as you know. But if you put us in a little pen and pin our wings, man, we're just like, <gasps> and some of us will shrink back and just, and just disappear. Other of us will come out and be rebellious and show out and be a heathen and displease God. And so you walk into a situation. When I walked into Brownsville to work and serve Pastor Kilpatrick, See, a lot of people say, well, you serve the church. I actually serve the angel of the church because he and I are probably going to spend more time behind the pulpit than anybody else in the sanctuary. In other words, I'm going to have a certain amount of time on Sunday morning. He's going to have a certain amount of time. And if we're not flowing together, we've got a problem. And guess who's going to win out? He's always going to win because he's the leadership. He's the federal headship of the church. Whatever he wants will happen. Okay? Now, I've got options. I can either make this man my enemy, or I can make this man my friend. I can be a creative, arrogant person, or I can say, Pastor, whatever you want. And see, Pastor Kerry's here. I do that with whoever's speaking. When Brother Crabtree spoke, I asked Brother Crabtree, is there anything you need? And man, I don't care if he wants me to do the Charleston and sing three verses of a song I've never heard. I'm going to give it a spin because I'm here to serve him. Well, what that does is that endears him to me because he goes, man, that guy's wanting to serve me. He'll just do anything I want. Let, why don't you go ahead and do some of your stuff? Well, then every once in a while you do something you want to do. And then he goes, I didn't really like that. And, but you keep doing and serving him and then you do another thing and finally you find something he likes. And you do it and do it and do it. And you gain confidence and you gain trust. And he learns that you're not gonna get up there and do something stupid. He, know, he learns that you're not going to try to show out in front of visitors. He learns that you know when Sunday morning comes, you know that, that, you know, when certain people, a lot of people say, well, you change your message. No, I'm pretty radical. This church is one of the rarest churches you'll find in that I can do anything on Sunday morning I can do any other time. But there, most of the time I choose not to. Not because of religion, but because these are Brownsville folks, and some of these folks are older folks, and they need to hear a hymn because it causes them to worship. It causes them to be pulled in and included. And how much leeway does pastor give me? An enormous amount. I've got a cushy job. I mean, it's really a wonderful thing. It's a rare thing. I've never worked in a situation like this where I had complete trust of the pastor. But to a certain degree, and I don't say this arrogantly, I have earned his trust. And that's what I want to say to musicians. You have to earn the trust of the people. You have to earn the trust of the leadership. And there's always going to be misunderstandings between leadership because of the way you operate. I am a project person. I am a person that you give me a project, I'll go after it. But if you give me anything that's monotonous, it's just going to be all I can do to make it happen. I'll do it, but it'll always be with the skin of my teeth. It'll never be excellent. But if you give me a project, one that's got to start and got to stop, I can fly. 
And because I'm a musician, I'm probably going to wait till the last day until I do it. But I work so well under pressure. That's why I get pimples. I do it to myself. <laughs> and I kick myself. I am worse on myself than anybody could ever be on me. I kick myself hard. But ultimately, I'll always wait till that last possible minute and then create like you wouldn't believe. And go, imagine what I could have done if I'd have really applied myself for about three months. The world may never know. I don't know. But it's a discipline. It's a, it's, it's, it's a thing that's unnatural for me. I am disciplined in some areas and undisciplined in others, just like you. There are some things that's easy for me. Getting to church is the hardest thing I do. It's the hardest thing I do. It really is. I think, God's, I think Satan's got a, got, an, got a plot for me that something will go wrong no matter what I do. And there are other people, it's not a problem. They just do it. And then I get to church and I'm mad. I've, I've hit the steering wheel all the way here and I'm just frustrated and aggravated and going, why can't I? And, I, you know, and I get mad at my wife and I fuss at her and then I get mad at myself and I fuss at myself. But the bottom line is with staff, for the pastor to know he can trust you. And let me say something to you. God called you there to lead, not to force feed. And if those people know you love them, and they know that you're there to serve them, they'll allow you a whole lot of freedom to be creative. And if you want to do some music that maybe isn't on the plate, that most, most people would never hear, or, you know, like, I remember I did History Maker one Sunday. And I thought, they're throwing me out after this. And it was amazing. What a high-tolerance church. The kids were all going, yeah! And the old folks were going, man, I could use it without the guitar. But I like Lendl, so it's okay. It's okay. If he says it's all right, it's all right. Do you see what I'm saying? It's about forbearing one another and loving one another and understanding that you're here to serve. So yes, pastor does give me a great deal of, of latitude, uh, but now there are times he doesn't. Uh, pastor Kerry is here and he's probably been back there before when pastor's got his mind. You can tell when his mind is on something. He furrows his brow when he's got a message and I can look at him. I can watch that man and I can tell by his body language how long I've got. Really, I can tell if, oh, this is a free night, do anything you want to. Or I can tell he's got something God's given him. I better do my two and get out of the way. And I do, man. I just, we sing a couple of choir songs. But you see, it's not, I don't need to prove every time I get up my worth. And I don't need to prove that I can pull something off. Because it's not, because we're in a relationship. I'm in a relationship with Kerry Robinson, the brothers of the pastor of this church. They know that I'll serve them. They know my flaws. I know their flaws. But we serve one another, and we love one another. And, and we, we all work on each other, you know? But yes, I do have a great deal. But I've, like I said, it's been, a, it's been an earning kind of thing. I got three more minutes. There's a gentleman back there with a question. And I'll, I, I'm going to be able to take this one, and uh, we've got to go. Let me let you hear, say that on the mic because they can't hear you up there. It seems like more recently God has been growing you and moving in the Spirit and allowing God's Spirit to move even in pauses and so forth. And if so, how have you been applying that to the service at, uh, in those applications? Okay, that's a good question. Um, actually, I can't take any credit for that. Uh, again, my pastor is the reason I did that. Early in the revival, I felt like I, I had to run the worship service like a radio station, that we didn't need any dead air and it needed to keep moving. And one day, Pastor John looks over at me and goes, Now, I know music directors that would get totally mad about that. You know, have you ever thought, you pastors ever wanted to look at your music director and go, Shh. He looked over at me and went, Shh. Wait, wait. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and all of a sudden from the people, uh, it's like the volume started just coming up. I remember the first night it happened in revival. And I learned that God, 
that as long as I'm playing, people wait for me to go to the next song. But when I stop playing, they know I'm waiting on them to do something. And then suddenly they start just worshiping. As long as I keep calling something out, they keep waiting on me to feed them. You know, and most congregations are force-fed. I went to a church one night, uh, just recently, Bob Phillips Church in Houston. And Bob told me before church, he said, Now, Lendl, this church is wide open, they're hungry, but they're not used to elongated free worship. And I said, oh, okay. Now, this is what he said to me, all right? So that first night of the meeting, I had two nights of meeting there. I had a Sunday night and Monday night. So the Sunday night, I thought the service was great. The worship was great. And I just shared about... 30 minutes and just talked about going after God in worship and just just letting what's in your heart come out of your mouth toward God and just going for it and not caring what people thought about you and just forget about all your stuff and your, your religion and shaking it off and and so at the end I said let's practice and that's when I had to get the musicians all off the stage because they kept playing, you know, and the people were waiting on them to go to another song. I said, I tell you what, all the musicians come down and stand around front, you know, get away from those instruments. I want, they were great musicians, but I wanted the people to worship the Lord, not the instruments. I wanted the people to worship the Lord. And the next night, Brother Kerry, I walked in on Monday night and I sang, I believe you are the one, because they'd already had worship. I sang this little old song, I sang a little ditty, and I mean, it's not exactly a enemy's camp, you know what I mean? It's not a stomp and snort song, you know, it's just kind of sweet and gentle, and, and I sang that, and I walked up just like this, and I put my Bible on the pulpit, and I turned to my text, and I got it ready, and I, kind of like I did today, I put, put my text out there, and I, and I said, you know, I just feel like we ought to just, just a minute, worship the Lord before I start, and it was just like that night when Pastor went, shh, he was like, Ooh, and it went on, and it went on, and I looked down at my watch, and finally I put my mic down. A lot happens when you put the mic down. I put the mic down, and I walked over to this side of the stage, and I just listened for 35 minutes. Those people sang to the Lord in their own song. And then I looked over at Bob and I went, I love services where you go. And, and, and Bob looked at me and went, and all of a sudden, about 35 minutes in, I heard this cadence start. People started kind of clapping. And I saw about eight little children dancing, twirling. And they started going around the church. Well, then I saw all the adults come after them, and they started dancing and twirling. I mean, big old men, you know, just dancing and twirling, and the women, and, and then they grabbed the banners off the walls of the church, and they started, I looked over at Bob, and I said, is this normal? <laughs> he said, I've never seen this happen. And it was because you gave a pause. You just let God, Evan Roberts was talked about, and I close, as I continue to close. I got one minute. Evan Roberts, I'm reading a, a book right now called The Invasion of God in Wales. It's a little booklet, just a little short booklet. And, and the book says that Evan Roberts in the Great Welsh Revival would many times just come in and sit on the front pew for three hours. And there would be silence. Great singers would come in and they wouldn't sing. They would just wait on the Lord. Sometimes they would worship for four or five hours, sing the same song for four or five hours. Azusa Street, the same thing. You see, we're worship leaders. That means all we do is get people in the gate and try to get them into the inner court and the outer court. Once we get them into the inner court, then our job is over. We just need to put our mic down, turn our keyboard off, and step back and let God do it. Because we're used to create, to bring the people in. Once they're in, you don't, they don't need your help. Once people get that religion off of them, and religion manifests itself by silence. People are afraid to lift their voice. Once they get that off of them and they get free, man, you'll, you'll, amaze, you'll, you'll be amazed at what happens. You just kind of stand back and watch it happen and go, wow, I'd have never thought of that. And that's what I'm doing, brother. I'm, I'm just trying to just wait on the Lord and see what God's going to do. 
Uh, if something goes crazy and, and I feel like it needs to be dealt with, I'll, I'll do something. But, but I'm watching it with a pastoral eye. But I'm, I'm so hungry for God. And I believe God wants to hear the pews sing and worship and glorify. He's heard all of our songs. He's heard all of our playing. He wants the heart of the people to come out to worship Him. And there comes a time we need just to be quiet. Like right now, I need to be quiet. God bless you. I love you and thank you so much. All right?